my journey on climate change and talk about the possibilities that exist um, for all of you. And I'm sure that climate change is on all of our minds as the floods are proceeding in northern New South Wales and, um, and in Queensland. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my journey, the challenge in addressing climate change for any individual, and then what others are doing in the space. So um, I wanted to start to take your minds to this forest in Tasmania. So this is the Styx Valley, which is um, in the southern part of Tasmania. And for those that have been there, if you want to see the tops of these trees, you need to lean all the way back because they're about 75 metres tall. And I was hiking in the Styx Valley after I'd bought a book called The Weathermakers by Tim Flannery in 2005. And I'd just been, it's kind of a random purchase at the airport and I was reading it and it was all about climate change. It was telling me about how um, floods would get terribly worse, how bushfires would get worse, how um, the burning of fossil fuels was um, fueling a great global heating and it was going to be absolutely pivotal to get down emissions. And all of this information was sort of percolating through my mind as I was in the Styx Valley this forest that had been there for over 400 years since before Europeans knew Australia existed. But then at the same time, reading about this existential threat and how we could fundamentally change the Earth's climate in just a generation. And I went home to Melbourne thinking, you know, oh, I've got to do something about this issue. Like, it's so huge. And what do I do? Well, I just felt worried, paralysed, scared, insignificant, powerless had those moments of waking up at four o'clock in the morning thinking climate change and I did nothing for the first um, six months the first six months I mainly um, worried then I had a conversation with my sister who was getting sort of frustrated with me talking about climate change and um, saying things like I don't know what to do and she said well we can all do something what is the something that you and I can do and we were both at uni so we started doing um, sort of organised some presentations to other students about climate change and about how young people could start working together. And that sort of evolved over time into an organisation that became the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. So from that sort of spark from my sister saying we need to do something, I suppose I looked at, well, where, where do I operate? I'm a uni student. I don't have any real, real power or knowledge, but I could talk to other young people. And it was clear to me that young people were going to be some of the most affected because the younger you are, the more impacted by climate change you'll be as the climate crisis proceeds. So I thought that it was really important that young people had a voice and it happened to be the group that I was most connected to. So the AYCC, this is a, a few photos from the journey it's um, an organisation now that's, um, I suppose, 15 or 16 years old. And it started um, in 2006 after we'd started doing these sort of presentations in schools and then other young people had said, I want to get involved as well. And the it was an opportunity for lots of people to get involved in um, advocating. So you would have seen this uh, student strikes, for instance, that happened in the last few years, the AYCC was really critical in supporting student strikers around Australia to get out there and um, tell their story and get um, people on the streets. Um, Repower Our Schools is an initiative about getting schools to practically reduce emissions and get students um, working together to help schools do that. Um, and lots of different initiatives that came out over time. Um, but after I'd sort of worked at AYCC for maybe five or six years and felt like I was um, tackling one gap, which was getting young people involved, the thing that really frustrated me was at that time, um, this is sort of 2010, 2011, was that there still wasn't any policy action. And the conversation that happened in Australia was generally between the sort of policy wonks, the scientists and the politicians, and it was a highly politicised issue. So when I left the AYCC and looked for something else, I went to a group called the Climate Commission. So the Climate Commission was a government body that was established under Julia Gillard to provide accurate information about climate change to the general public. And this is Tim Flannery, who you might be familiar with, 
um, an Australian of the year who is a scientist and we work with lots of other scientists trying to translate that information. Um, and we're independent of government and my role was as, as the communications advisor. So this was at the, um, during the carbon tax debate when there was so much animosity about climate change, it was a really challenging issue to be working on. This particular speech where Tim is talking, we were in um, Parramatta and the, um, the Andrew, uh, no, was Al, Alan Jones had just encouraged all of his supporters to come and see us give this presentation. So it was literally someone had blown up. It was a really strange um, protest, but there was one guy on the street with a huge snowman shouting, death to Flannery, death to Flannery. And um, there was penguins that jumped up during the presentation saying, you know, climate change isn't real and a bunch of those sorts of things. So it was actually a really charged political environment to be working in and advising people on how to, how to operate. Well, with the Abbott government coming in, which was in 2013, the first act of the Abbott government was to abolish um, the Climate Commission. So we'd been potentially too successful in communicating. Sorry, you might be able to hear my baby just crying. Um, the, he's, he's off now. With, don't worry, he's being, being cared for. Um, his, the, the Climate Commission was abolished in, um, in 2013 first act of the Abbott government. And you might remember in 2013, there was this sort of shift in the political scene where Tony Abbott had come into power. He was a climate skeptic. He denied the research linking climate to bushfires. And this picture on the left has now become sort of infamous where it was the um, coalition government um, scrapping a whole range of different policies on climate change, including the climate, um, the, the carbon tax. So when we were abolished, it was clear to me that this would probably happen, we didn't know how, but that it was going to be really important to continue to do the work we'd done. Um, putting accurate information on climate change out to the general public, we'd seen in Canada when there'd been a similar um, denying conservative government coming to power that they'd taken away all the funding for a range of different climate science organisations that had been pu publicly speaking and they made it very difficult for people to speak out. So we thought that having an independent group was going to be vital. So four days after that abolition, um, we went out on a limb and asked the general public to fund a new startup, which was called the Climate Council. So it was launched at 12.01 and got a bit of media um, just in that evening and a bit of Twitter conversation. So 12.01, the website goes up and I get one donation from a guy called Steve over in Perth who donated $15, like, that's good. Then by the morning when I was refreshing my feed, we'd been raising money at about $1,000 an hour. And then as the day progresses, we just went through this cyclone of media interest and we raised a huge amount of money. It hit the newspapers, it was on the radio, we did our first press conference, all that happened by about 9.30 came back to my computer, press refresh, we'd raise $120,000. By the end of the day, we'd raise $5, $500,000 and PayPal shut us down because I thought we must be money laundering. We were raising money so fast. Similarly, on Twitter, we grew so quickly that Twitter assumed that we were um, sort of a fake account. So here are two sort of slides from that time when on our, um, on our, I don't think we were using Instagram straight away, but this is our sort of Facebook and Twitter. Um, it shows you some of the stats in that early time. So over the week, we raised $1.3 million, which at the time was Australia's biggest ever crowdfunder and um, was bigger than the previous climate um, commission's budget. So that was enormously um, supportive for me as someone that'd be working in climate change in that sort of difficult environment from that Parramatta talk to know that there's 20,000 people behind us putting their money in their pocket and saying, we will help you to fund this new organisation go out there and do it. And because we then were not a government organisation, it became very flexible how we would um, do the work that we wanted to do. So I just wanted to tell you what our, um, our mission and what we do, but I'll get into more detail on this. So our mission is to be a courageous catalyst propelling Australia towards effective action to tackle the climate crisis. So we think that being courageous is one of the key, key things on this issue. We live at a time when we're enormously privileged to live at a time when it matters to be alive and it matters what we do. 
how much action we can possibly get happening on climate change will be critical to the lives of those that follow after us for hundreds of years. It's a very unusual period of time to live in and that courage needs to sort of propel us forward. Um, a catalyst means that we are helping others to act. We obviously, uh, you know, can't do it all. <laughs> we are an organisation that specialises really in information and communications. So we're there to help others to act, whether that's in business or government, etc. So I'll go through these three areas that we work on, providing foundational information, shaping the conversation and convening other groups to lead, act and advocate. So that first point of providing information, this is just a collection of our reports. We provide, as we did at the Climate Commission, trusted, accessible, authoritative information. Um, climate change, as you would be well aware from the problem to the impacts to the solutions, there's a huge amount of content. Um, the solutions, for instance, cover 46 sectors of the Australian economy. You know, there's a lot of content for people to get across and a lot of complexity. So we see ourselves as the translators, but being able to rely on scientists, economists, people that have that authority to put that information together. So we've got 120, maybe 130 now um, publications on our website. And we seek to make sure that all of that is 100% accurate because there's so much misinformation flying around in this space. The second thing we do is try and shape the national narrative. And we do this in a number of ways. The first is that we do a lot of media coverage that's supported by our, um, our, our online presence, whether it's our website or whether it's our social media channels, often sharing the, the media content, but also doing a whole range of other more specific things that are relevant for that audience. So we think very deeply about what is the message that is powerful with different audiences and which audiences are critical to shift to help shift the political environment. I see the... Um, communications really as setting the um, setting the parameters for politicians and other decision makers to make their decisions. It's their sort of environment that they operate within. So if we can change the operating environment over time, we make it more difficult to make bad decisions, investing in fossil fuels, for instance, and we make it more easy to do good decisions, whether that's policies to grow renewable energy or whether that's enabling investment decisions. Um, we all operate in, a, um, in an environment where we, um, we hear communications from a range of different sources, whether that's our friends and family or whether that's the media, et cetera, and that shapes our understanding of the world. So this has been one critical thing for us is just getting all of our spokespeople into the media and there's a group of them there. Um, another one is showing, not telling. We take journalists to the places where um, where either the problem is most obvious or where we can show solutions. So on the left, you can see um, a bleached part of the Great Barrier Reef and you can see Tim Flannery, myself, another reef scientist, and we're there being filmed by um, a range of different media outlets who came on the boat out with us to see the bleaching. If we weren't taking journalists to see the bleaching, there literally just wouldn't be that much footage because it costs a lot to get cameras out there and to get the underwater cameras to really capture the bleaching. So that was really important to be able to tell that story to Australians. On the right is some offshore wind in the UK and um, one of our specialists talking to, um, to a journalist there. So taking journalists overseas because often we can really get in a bubble in Australia, not realizing how much is actually happening around the world. So it's really important to show the rest of the world is actually moving pretty fast on this, particularly from a technological um, perspective. And let's make sure that we as Australians can see what's happening. And the third thing is empowering others. So <clears throat> I said earlier that when I went into working climate communications, um, I was worried that this was just about policy wonks and scientists and we didn't, not enough Australians could see themselves reflected in those talking about climate change. <clears throat> excuse me. So when I started the Climate Council, I felt really passionate about getting a whole range of other voices speaking. So that started with experts, but then I started another sort of startup within a startup, if you like, called the Climate Media Centre, which is essentially a PR hub for climate change. So the Climate Media Centre works with doctors, farmers, solar installers, 
surfers, AFL players, a whole raft of different people to get different voices out there um, in the media and on social media, et cetera, in the whole communications landscape, talking about climate change. And they will go and speak to their politicians, for instance. So, you know, it's hard for me to go and talk to a conservative politician about climate change and get heard, whereas a farmer might have much more traction. A, a defence, um, a former defence chief might have more traction. So that's the sort of lens that we look at it through through the Climate Media Centre. So you can see Charlie Prell with his little wind turbine. He's a farmer um, near nearish to Canberra and Goulburn. And um, he's the chair of Farmers for Climate Action, a new group. Then there's Anne Sharma. She's a teenage litigant. She um, and a whole range of other young people have been taking the environment minister to court to say, you've been negligent by failing to address climate change and endangering our future. So it's got a lot of media traction through our support. And those teenagers, it's a really great story about speaking truth to power. Um, there's Belinda Bagg, she's from Surfers for Climate Action. She's a famous surfer and she's involved a whole range of other surfers to um, tell the story to particularly to coastal communities on what is the impact of climate change. And they had a big role in stopping um, an offshore drilling project called PEP11 recently in New South Wales. Then there's Darren Sullivan, a firefighter. Firefighters have a really important role to play in tackling extreme weather events as we've just been seeing. It's not just Firefighters fighting fires, they also help in swift water rescue, for instance. And firefighters have been a really important voice in helping um, the community to understand how quickly climate change. Big group of um, former emergency leaders, 37 former emergency leaders headed up by Greg Mullins. This is another of our sort of startup within a startup, if you like, or a new brand. Um, prior to the Black Summer fires, it was clear that it was going to be a terrible bushfire season. And we thought it was really important to have people speak out that could speak with a lot of credibility about what the threat posed and what needed to be done in advance of that bushfire season. So we worked with Greg Mullins, who was one of our, um, our spokespeople, to engage a whole lot of other emergency chiefs. And you may remember this because it was a big media story. In April 2019, this group came out and said, it's going to be a really bad bushfire season. We've written to the Prime Minister, we need significant action that fell on deaf ears through the whole year. They were knocking on the door, knocking on the door, and there was no interest to meet from the Prime Minister or the Emergency Services Minister, et cetera. So they got out in the community and did a whole lot of media work, trying to alert communities to the scale of the threat um, and local government, et cetera. Unfortunately, we all saw what Black Summer ended up being, which was the most horrific bushfire season in Australia's history with such a um, scale of disaster that unfortunately may be um, this flood may actually be bigger in terms of the cost of a disaster, but at the time that was the largest disaster in Australia's history. And it was very important that Greg and others could contextualise that climate change was driving the scale of this weather event and also to hold the Prime Minister and others to account to say, hey, we warned you that this was happening and not enough action was taken in advance. We didn't have the aerial capacity we'd needed. Communities weren't aware of the scale of the threat in their area, et cetera, et cetera. Greg helped to um, push for a Royal Commission. The Royal Commission came out with a range of different recommendations and um, emergency leaders have been, again, doing that accountability piece, constantly talking to journalists about, hey, you need to ask questions about what is, out of the 80 recommendations, what's been, re what's been implemented and what hasn't. And unfortunately, most of those recommendations were not acted upon prior to this current flood. So Greg and his friends were up in Brisbane yesterday doing a press conference saying it's not good enough. There was, we weren't prepared enough for these floods. Fair enough, we, it's unprecedented. It's the biggest flood that we've ever seen, but being unprecedented is not a reason to be unprepared because we knew that this type of thing was coming. And it's important that the recommendations from the Royal Commission are implemented to help us better um, deal with emergencies and that local communities, emergency services, et cetera, are properly resourced and have the information required. So they did a big, you might have seen it in the news yesterday. Um, and this was a, a, a statement on, I, I like this because it was on hack, but um, that was a good illustration um, on their Instagram feed that federal government's fumbling, fumbling of this flood disaster is Black Summer all over again. Again, the fire chiefs really drew that link between the two different events. Um, you know, climate change is 
accelerating and um, increasing the frequency of these types of weather events and to have them almost back to back like within a couple of summers is just so devastating and we need to make sure it's sheeted home to the federal government has not tackled climate change and they have not prepared communities and I think it's the emergency leaders have done a great job in doing that. The third aspect of what we work on is uh, that catalyst, um, being a catalyst to enable others to drive change and this is our um, another startup within a startup, if you like, um, the city's power partnership. So I call them startups within a startup because the way that I've structured the Climate Council is to have different projects that can really stand alone. They have their own leadership. They often have their own fundraising um, capacity. And because obviously we don't sell a product, we have to raise money to do what we do. And so they'll do quite a bit of their own um, fundraising capacity. They'll draw on the Climate Council for research support, for communication support, for um, their administration and all of those things, but they can exist to do a whole lot of their own agenda. And I do that because I love the culture of a startup, how you can move really quickly, you can make decisions really quickly in small groups, and you can be highly responsive to what you're trying um, to achieve in your mission. So the city's power partnership is in fact engaging local governments. So that sort of responsive element is that they can be talking to local government about what they need and making decisions quickly about shifting. And it's about getting local governments to install um, projects and policies that can be getting down emissions and growing renewable energy, as well as um, helping local governments become advocates to state and federal governments to help them do those policy and investment pieces. So this is a group of local governments seeing a massive solar farm in the Flinders Ranges. And um, this is part of what we do is just expose local governments to the types of things that they could do. And um, we've now, the Cities Power Partnership covers local governments representing 65% of Australians. So often here, you know, the federal government's not doing enough and that's absolutely true. But at different levels of government, local, state, there's actually a lot happening. And to be covering 65% of Australia's population with around about 170 councils has been a really um, powerful way to show what can be done, but also to get um, projects underway that can be scaled and replicated at larger levels of government or other local governments. So if we can get projects and policies that work, if we can show almost the business case, if you like, then we can hope that, you know, it continues, it continues on. And once the federal government late to the party arrives, they can be taking up these solutions that are underway everywhere else. So what's changed in that time? There's a lot of public concern has grown. Um, you can really see that at the moment the significant climate action at state and local levels, business and community are leading the way. The public gets what solutions are now where they didn't. Eight years ago, renewable energy wasn't um, really something that was discussed. Coal has largely lost its social license and gas is on the way to losing its social license too. And Australians are increasingly experiencing climate change, but it's not just that they've experienced it through these floods or fires or drought, it's that they understand that climate change is what's driving it. And we've got that diversity of voices that are now speaking out. Um, but the political situation remains pretty vexed at a federal level. There's Scott Morrison holding a lump of coal just a few years ago. Um, but on the right, you see a lot of progress. So this is the New South Wales government that is a, um, a liberal national government, but there's Matt Keane on the far left who um, has initiated a whole range of renewable energy zones across the state. And you can see John Bellalaro in the orange vest at the back from the nationals that working together to get these um, renewable energy zones in regional parts of New South Wales. What's business doing? I wanted to share with you a few examples because I know um, many of you will be thinking about, well, what is the role for me in all of this? Um, there's so much business leadership going on now and I wanted to draw out a few examples the first is doing commitments and action to reduce pollutions within operations and value chains. So there's two big initiatives um, amongst others. There's RE100, which is about powering all of the operations and potentially supply chains with renewable energy. There's net, going to net zero, which again looks at supply chain too. How do you get emissions down entirely across the organisation? I bring I put a few examples there and I think Woolworths 
is um, doing a good job because they're not only um, trying to make this change within the organisation, um, but they're doing a lot publicly and they've obviously got a big retail business so they can tell the story to consumers consistently. So they obviously haven't got everything right, but I think that <clears throat> they're on a good path. Secondly, investment. Um, I think you all know um, this guy. I love the way um, Mike Cannon-Brooks is approaching his investments because he's doing so again in a very um, public way and trying to not only um, change what he's doing, but also to bring others along with him. So you might have seen the Sun Cable Initiative, which is one of the biggest um, solar and renewable projects in Australia's history that he's progressing. It was in the news today. He's doing that with Andrew Forrest. He's done a range of other initiatives. He was in the news a couple of weeks ago, also trying to do a takeover bid with AGL, um, which is the biggest um, uh, coal, coal polluter in Australia. So he's done some fantastic things in this space. Um, so he could also be for the next slide, which is advocacy. But I drew out Sam Moston, who's a board director across a range of different companies. So Sam, 20 years ago, was working at um, Insurance Group Australia, trying to move insurance companies to do more on climate change. Um, but now she's also on the boards of Virgin, on Mervac, um, Transurban, a range of different boards. And you can see in each of those cases that she's doing a whole range of advocacy work to help those companies do things differently. She's on the board of our uh, organisation as well as the Climate Council and she does a whole lot of um, speaking out publicly, particularly about how business can do more and how she really sees the flow of capital as being critical in terms of creating change that politicians will follow the capital rather than the other way around. Although obviously we do need some policy settings that enable that to happen too. But she talks a lot about how capital is shifting around the world and that investment environment is making it um, easier and easier for companies to do, do more and then for governments to do more too and the Australian government needing to catch up. So her advocacy has been really powerful. Another example is developing solutions. So this is Sam Elsom from Seaforest. He's really passionate about seaweed and there's so many um, initiatives now right around Australia, right around the world with people thinking, well, how can I take my, um, my capacity in developing solutions? And particularly people with that sort of startup mentality, um, founder mentality, and make something brilliant that can reduce emissions or help us get away from fossil fuels. Um, I wanted to mention this particularly because I think in an environment where so many of you are founders or work for organisations that are in that sort of um, startup or one of the startup phases, I suppose, there's often many of them. Um, there's so much power in that mentality. And as I am sort of, a, I think of myself as a social entrepreneur, if you like, um, but it's such a rare skill set, people that can create a vision and then say, well, how am I going to make this vision happen and then actually do it? It's such a powerful skill set and sense of self-belief. So this is something that, you know, you can't necessarily buy into organisations. It's really hard to find. So if you've got it, it's something that can be harnessed in tackling the climate crisis. So just a couple of final um, comments. Um, what else has changed? Climate change went from being something that was a future issue to being around us right now. So this is Cabago in Southern New South Wales, sort of before and after the Black Summer bushfires, that town was um, raised to the ground. And, you know, the experience that many in northern New South Wales and southern Queensland are going through now, um, Cabago was experiencing a couple of years ago, um, but from a different type of extreme weather event. This is the Wilson River over, um, over Lismore. And you can see just the sheer scale of devastation with a um, flood that absolutely smashed records, you know, by two metres, this flood was off the charts. And it's not as if this community hasn't been experiencing severe weather events. The weather events are one after the other after the other. Lismore's experienced three um, major flooding events, the sort of mega floods, one in a hundred, one in a thousand year events in the last 10 years. So it's absolutely here with us now. And as I've mentioned, it's primarily caused by the burning of coal, oil and gas. So the solution to climate crisis is relatively simple. We need to get off these things. And whether it's changing the way we invest, changing the policies that we have, or whether it's developing new solutions, but 
actually the technology is all there to do the transition we need to do right now. Like there will be new technologies as well, but we have all the technology to get us to net zero now. So it's really a question of speed and scale in tackling the crisis. So who are the leaders that we need right now? Um, that was my sort of first slide. I think it's about culture within organisations that allows us to take risks when we are sort of thinking about our sphere of influence and how we can create some change. Re-evaluating our roles. We often say, oh, it's too hard. That feeling I had when I was sort of starting to think about climate change, it's very self-limiting. It's too scary. It's too big. I don't know my role. All of that can be a get out of jail free card and say, you know, it's too, too hard for me to act. There's a lot of opportunity to invest in allies and partners. There's lots of different business partnerships from investors group on climate change, to the RE100. There's lots of opportunities to do things together. And I think the making of ambitious but realistic goals to tackle climate change, whether that's individually in our own life, whether that's at our companies, wherever it is that makes sense for you to be having a role in tackling this crisis, we need you right now. <laughs> it's gonna be the most important issue of our time and everyone needs to be involved. I just wanted to end on a little story about this little hummingbird. So I'd take you with me um, out of wherever you are, across the world to, um, to an African forest and it's dark. There's, um, you know, just a peaceful evening and we're all asleep and the animals are all asleep too. And we then hear some thunder and lightning, a storm comes across and dry lightning strikes. It hits one of the trees and that tree bursts into flames. All the animals look at the tree thinking, oh dear, this is, this is not good. The fire starts to spread and it starts to consume the forest. More and more trees catch fire, more bushes. It's really taking off. And the animals are all paralyzed watching the fire consume their homes. Then they hear a tiny noise bzz, go past them. They look and it's the hummingbird, the smallest animal of all. And it's taking one droplet of water to the fire and dropping it on. It makes absolutely no difference. And the hummingbird goes back, another droplet of water, another droplet of water. The elephant, the largest animal says, what are you doing? You can't possibly make a difference. And the hummingbird says, I'm doing something. I'm doing the best I can. The monkeys are inspired. They get some banana leaves and throw water on the fire. They inspire the rhinoceroses who start stamping on the fire too. And eventually even the elephant that was so skeptical at the start brings up the water in his trunk and sprays out the fire. So I end with encouraging you all to be hummingbirds, whatever influence you can have in the world or in your company or um, in your children's school, whatever it is, there's opportunities for us all to be engaged in this issue. So I'll hand back to our moderators today um, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Amanda. I think that was exactly what we needed. Um, as I think you'll see, if you have a look at the chat, um, there are a lot of people saying that this is the sort of beginning to this summit that we needed, um, the credibility of what you've brought to the climate debate in the Australian context, but also your encouragement to think about who you can be, whether that's an advocate, whether that's an investor, whether that's someone just thinking about reducing emissions in your operations, or whether that's actually developing the solutions themselves. So thank you so much, Amanda.